So, first of all, the test is not going to be this week. If you looked on Sakai, it was scheduled for this week. It's not written, and I want to give you a little more heads up, so we'll just have it next week. Um, for now, we are going to dive right into Kelp to this, and we are going to discuss a very important help to this rule called the chain rule. I mean, I hope that everything I teach you is at least sort of important, but the chain rule is really significant. We'll use it pretty much daily after we finish this week. And the chain rule is the chain rule, but it's traditionally presented to students in two different ways. So what we're going to present now is what we call version one of the chain rule. And the chain rule is a tool for differentiating composition. So when you have one function stuck inside another function. And version one of the chain rule is basically, well, it's used basically for word problems, first of all. And let's, before we try to go any further, let's present what the chain rule says. The chain rule, or at least version one of the chain rule, is used when you have not the x and the y that we are used to, but three variables. And we'll keep X and we'll keep Y. For now, let's call the third variable a T. As I say, this is mostly used or frequently used in chain <coughs> rule in story problems. So often instead of X, Y, and T, you'll have more meaningful variable names. But say that we have three variables and two functions. Y is a function of X. That's exactly what we're used to. But now x, instead of just being a variable, is also going to be a function. x is a function of t. So going back to what I said earlier, what we have here is a composition. We've got g of t stuck inside of f. So we have f of g of t. And what this notation is telling you is that f is a function of t. Let's try to make sure we're all on the same page with this statement. 
We have an input T. And from that input, we can get x. This is using the function g. Now we have x. And from that input, we can get y. Um, this is from the function f. Well, therefore, we can go from a T to Y. I mean, we're taking kind of a detour, but if we start at T, go to X, then go to Y, ultimately, we're starting at T and ending at Y. And this is a function. It's F of g of t. And our goal is to take the derivative of this new function. And version one of the chain rule, it's framed in terms of Leibniz notation. And version one of the chain rule says, okay, we have this variable y, it's a function of t. So, we can ask for the derivative of y with respect to t. And to take the derivative of y with respect to t, we take two derivatives. We take the derivative of each of these composite functions so we take the derivative dx dt, and we take the derivative dy dx, and we multiply them together. And I think that version one of the chain rule is the kind of thing that looks incredibly cryptic until you do an example, and once you do an example, it will suddenly become a lot e uh, clearer what we mean by all of this. So say that we have the relationships. Y equals the sign of X. X equals t squared plus 1. Then y is a function of t. I mean, more specifically, if you take this x and you plug it in there, you see that y is the sign of t squared plus 1. But these details that I put in red aren't important to the problem. I just wanted to emphasize that y is a function of t. And because y is a function of t, asking for the derivative of y in terms of the variable t makes sense. It makes sense to look at that relationship and ask what the derivative is. And what the chain rule says is to find this derivative well, we have a function there, 
and we have a function there, and we can take the derivative of the sine, and we can take the derivative of t squared plus one, and the chain rule says, okay, you take the derivative of the sine, Notice our variable is here, our y and x, hence dy dx. And then you take the derivative of t squared plus 1. Our variable was here, our x and t. So when you take the derivative, it will be dx dt. And you multiply those derivatives together, and that gives you the derivative of y with respect to t. dy dx, we hopefully have all these trig derivatives down, but if not, we certainly need the sine and the cosine down. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. dx dt. Again, we're hopefully pretty, pretty handy with the power rule right now. The derivative of t squared plus 1 is 2t. And according to the chain rule, version 1, this is the derivative. But, but something is clearly weird about this answer. In particular, notice that our answer has an x in it, and it has a t in it. So our answer has two variables. We only want one variable. y is a function of t. We're asking for the derivative of y with respect to t. This x does not belong. Fortunately, this x is also easily gotten rid of because if we go over here, we've already circled it, but we can circle it even harder, x is t squared plus 1. So if x is t squared plus 1, then the cosine of x is the cosine of t squared plus 1. And this is being multiplied by 2t. And maybe it's more traditional to write polynomials in front of trig functions. So maybe we move things around a little. But aside from that kind of aesthetic step, um, there is the derivative we are looking for. That's the idea behind the chain rule. We should do more examples. In particular, we should justify my assertion that these things show up a lot in kind of story problems and applications. But 
just from what you've seen so far, does this make sense to everyone? Let's, I see some nodding, let's put that assertion to the test. Let's say y is 2x squared plus the side of x, and x is the cosine of t. And I'd like to pause class for just a moment, and let's see if you can use your notes to replicate the problem we just did with a different y and a different x. Let's try to find dy dt. I'll pause the recording while this happens and walk around and look at your work. No, I don't want to stop. Okay, that's finally, I I said we were going to look at this claim, but then we paused class and had you do a problem instead. Um, this version of the chain rule shows up fairly frequently in kind of natural situations, because all it's describing is you have one thing depending on another thing. This other thing is depending on a third thing. And you want to know how the first and the third things relate. And let's uh, demystify that statement with a concrete example. Let's say that I hold this thing, this little pen, in front of my eye, and then I start moving the pen away from my eye. Then two things, or at least two things, are happening here. What's happening, first of all, is that as time changes, the distance between this pen and my eye increases. And I don't really have much intuition in terms of like time and millimeters of how fast this is. So let's just make something up. Let's say this is starting 10 millimeters from my eye. Uh, I do not want to include the units in the function itself. Let's say it's starting 10 millimeters from my eye, and that distance is increasing at a rate of um, 5t. And actually, instead of distance, sorry, I know it's much easier for me to erase on the board, uh, than it is for you to maybe change things in my, your notebook. I'm going to call that S. And we can talk about Y at the end of the problem. But here's another thing that's going on. The focal length of my pupil, as I try to focus on this pen changes as the distance between my n, my pa, my k, 
cannot speak suddenly. It changes as the distance between the pen and my eye changes. The focal length of your pupil, as you look at something far away, is different from the focal length of your pupil when you try to focus on something that's close to you. So the focal length <coughs> depends on the distance, and in particular, the relationship between the focal length and the distance is given by this little quotient, 25s divided by 25 plus s. And now let's say we ask the question as time passes, how does the focal length of my eye change. We're asking for a rate of change, so we're asking for a derivative. Um, but what derivative are we asking for in particular? Well, we want to know how the focal length, df, changes with time, dt. So that's the derivative we're asking for. And in particular, it's not either of the derivatives that we could take from this or this. If we take the derivative of s of t, we get ds dt, and that tells you how the distance changes with time. If we take the derivative of this, we get df ds, how the focal length changes with the distance. So how the distance changes with time, how the focal length changes with distance. If we want to know how the focal length changes with time, the chain rule says that you take these derivatives and you multiply them together. Um, the reason I, I had d of t, d for distance, and then I changed that to s, the only reason I didn't is that if I hadn't changed it, I would have wound up with that d d, where the first d represents the derivative and the second d represents distance. And I thought that might be a little confusing, so that's the reason. I ended up using S. But now, as far as finding the derivative we're looking for, df dt, it's just a matter of taking individual derivatives, multiplying them together, and then replacing one variable with another variable. 
As a matter of fact, there's really no reason that you shouldn't do this. So let's have you do this. You'll need the quotient rule for f of s. Otherwise, this should just be like the problem you just did. And after you've attempted it, we'll do it together. Quotient and product rules aren't going to go away, so I, if you haven't just memorized them, you should probably make a priority of that, but that's it's obviously kind of a little awkward, but I was going to say it's a little awkward to not have room on that frame, but it really isn't so bad. Let me just quickly copy those functions over. There's S of T and let me use another color here. F of S is 25S divided by 25 plus S. And I have asked how the focal length is changing with time, and I've already indicated that we need to just take these derivatives and multiply them together. One of these derivatives is hopefully pretty straightforward. The derivative of that s of t is just 5. The derivative of 10 is 0. The derivative of 5t is 5. 0 plus 5 is 5. This is uglier just in the sense that it's going to require the quotient rule. And even though I've said you have to memorize it, the quotient rule is kind of messy. We'll fill in the denominator first. We just take the denominator and square it. No derivatives. Then, and I guess the upside is that at least this numerator and this denominator aren't going to have messy derivatives. The derivative of the top is 25. The bottom we leave alone. Minus, and now the top we leave alone, and the derivative of 25 plus s is 1. So I'm not forgetting to write a derivative here, it's just multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. And our next step because, I mean, this isn't, uh, this isn't done. The variable we are looking for here is t. So what are all of these s's floating around? Well, the next step is going to be to take the fact that s is 10 plus 5t and do, uh, do, sorry, do some pretty significant plugging in. s appears three times, but if we simplify this a little, we can make our life easier. When we distribute this, we're going to have 25 times 25 plus 25s 
minus 25s. So if you distribute this, your s's do go away in the numerator. And that makes life a little nicer. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it makes life much nicer. Can somebody with a calculator give me 25 squared? It's 25. Thank you. So that leaves the denominator where we have to plug stuff in. And here, it's, I think it's really helping us if we don't foil with a denominator. If we replace s with 10 plus 5t, we get 35 plus 5t. So saying that again, we are replacing s with 10 plus 5t. So we have 25 plus 10 gives us this 35, and then plus this 5t. In the top, we have 5 times 625. Can someone give that to me? 3125. And we have done the problem and found the derivative. So that's that's version one of the chain rule. And aside from doing other examples, I don't have a lot to say about it. Um, and since we have 10 minutes left, though, I guess we should do another example. Um, that's because our time is a little limited. Let's try to keep this, keep the math here pretty straightforward. Let's say you're heating a circular metal thing. As you heat metal, it expands. That's thermal expansion. So as you heat this metal circular plate, it's going to get bigger. Let's express the bigness of the plate in terms of the radius. Let's say that the radius with respect to time is 2 plus 0 0.001t inches. Well, just like we're looking at how the radius is changing with time, we could ask how the area is changing with time. And the area is a function of the radius. So we can, let's, uh, let's look at these derivatives. The first derivative, if you take it, tells you how the radius changes with the time. The second derivative, if you take it, tells how the area changes with the radius. 
So if you want to know how is the area changing with time, neither of these derivatives is what we're looking for. We want to know dA dt. And from what we have on the board, we could find dr dt. Or we could find dA dr. We could find either of those derivatives without any special rule. But neither of those is the derivative I've asked you for. And let's move that left so we have room to write to find the derivative dA dt. We need to take these component derivatives these derivatives that we can find and multiply them together. That's version one of the chain rule. And we're sort of low on time, so let me not mess around with colors or try to be fancy here. The derivative of this first function, dr dt, is 0 0.0001. The derivative of that second function, don't get confused by that pi. Pi is just a constant. It just sits there like any other constant would. So the pi sits there, the two comes down, and we're using the power rule here. Two minus one is one. So that's two r to the first. Wouldn't ordinarily bother to write a first power. So that's zero point zero zero two. In spite of my best efforts, where I ended up kind of cramped into the corner. But 0 0.001 times 2 gives us this. The pi is still there. It's just sitting there. That leaves r. And r, we know, is 2 plus 0 0.001 times So, sort of ugly, math is always sort of ugly looking when it has to be spread over two lines, but there is the derivative that you're looking for. And again, just going over this one last time, this point zero zero one, this pi, and this two, Combine to give us that part of the answer. This R gave us that part of the answer. And that's version one of the chain rule. That's some. Um, Introduce the idea behind version two. 
version two just says that, um, well, version two is a tool for just taking compositions. So like going back here, I did the composition. I said that y is a function of t, and not only that, I can tell you what y is. Y is the sine of t squared plus one. What if I didn't give you any thing else on this frame? What if I just told you y is the sine of t squared plus one? What is the derivative of y with respect to t? Well, in this situation, we would use version two of the chain rule, which we will spend all of tomorrow discussing. So I'll see you Tuesday, right and early.